Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of C Trey Sports One on One. I'm Sam Valenti, joined today by a true legend in the sports broadcasting business, the voice of Pac 12, then Pac 10 football for many years, and of course, many legendary boxing matches, including the epic fight in Moscow between Rocky Balboa and Ivan Drago, the one and only Barry Tompkins. How are you doing today, Barry? I'm doing good, Sam. Glad to be with you. Yeah, it's truly, truly a pleasure to be talking with you now. So let's let's start off from the beginning here. What were some of your first memories of watching sports growing up in San Francisco? Well, you know, like everybody else, and I'm sure like yourself and and probably most of your, your peers at, at ASU, um, you start out as a fan. You know, I was a a huge sports fan when I was a kid and, you know, a quasi athlete. I was a high school athlete, never any more than that. But, but that was my life. Sports was my life. Growing up, I never read a comic book. All I ever read was the sporting news. And, and at that time it was the St. Louis sporting news. And it was just filled with statistics. And I knew more about statistics when I was 10 years old than I do now. Um, it, it's uh, so that's the way I started out just as, as a fan. And quite honestly, I never, um, I never really aspired to do what I'm doing. I might have when I was 10 or 11 or 12 years old, but by the time I got out of high school, uh, you know, I thought that's an absolute long shot to be able to, to do what I do. You know, it's not, there weren't places to learn it like there are now, you know, like the Cronkite school is obviously one of the greats. Syracuse has always been one of the greats, but it was really just Syracuse and a little bit at Northwestern and a little bit at Missouri. That was, those are the only schools you could really go to if you wanted to do what I do. So I, I gave that thought up, you know, probably when I was a junior or senior in high school. So I wanted to be a cartoonist <laughs> is what I wanted to do. And, uh, and, and it just all happened kind of serendipitous, serendipitously. It really, my whole career, Sam, you should know this, has been an absolute fluke. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so like, what was that moment? You, 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 know, you know, when did that mo- moment come when you, when you were just like, like, you were just like, yep, I'm going into broadcasting. What, what you know, when, when was that moment? When did it happen? You know, I think it was more broadcasting found me than I found broadcasting. Um, when I, Excuse me. Um, I got into the, I was always a writer and really my background to this day is still as a writer. I mean, that that's kind of how I got my chops at the very beginning. And, uh, you know, I still, I write a newspaper column still, and I don't do a lot of writing on the shows that I do because they're live events and, you know, there isn't a lot of writing. So, uh, you know, I, I can't say I, I ply what I consider to be my trade as a, as a play-by-play guy, but I was working for an, I got in the advertising business and I was working as a copywriter for an advertising agency. And uh, I realized how much I hated the advertising business after about a year, maybe about two, I might've lasted two years. And um, I had my client at the agency that I was working for was KCBS radio in San Francisco. And I so desperately wanted to get out of the advertising business that they offered me a job actually as promotions director. So I was writing and I have a a little bit of a musical background. So I was writing jingles and little, you know, on air commercial kinds of things. And, you know, stay tuned Wednesday, Stanford plays Cal, you know, Don Klein with the broadcast, you know, that, that kind of stuff. That's what I was really hired there for. And, um, I mentioned his name already, but Don Klein, and and probably, I doubt that you or anyone in your age group would really remember Don Klein. But for a long time in the Bay Area, he was kind of the guy. He did the he did Stanford football and basketball, and then later on he did the 49ers. Uh, so was, he was really highly thought of, uh, and he was the sports director at KCBS. And at that time, as I told you, I was a I was a really big fan, you know. So I. Almost from the day I got there, I I, uh, I went into his office and introduced myself and just I was in his face all the time. I'm a writer. I can write this stuff. You know, you do. He was doing a bunch of commentaries every day. Uh, so I said, I can write your commentaries. Let me write your commentaries. Let me try. I, and he finally said, OK, OK, OK. And I'm sure he just did it to get me out of his face, you know, <laughs> so I wouldn't be there every day. <laughs> but uh, that's how it started. That's how I kind of segued from advertising and promotion into sports. And uh, so he, I, I really, I owe my career to Don Klein. And I think 
everybody, probably yourself included, somewhere along the line, you're going to have a mentor if you don't already have one. Um, and Don was mine. And, you know, to this day, and that was, gosh, you know, 56 years ago, you know, and uh, to this day, I, I still take a lot of the things that he told me as gospel, you know, and I think it's really helped me in my career. And uh, I think it's kept my ego in check. And even in football, you know, my spotting boards today are obviously technology has changed and all that has changed. But but in terms of information and how you gather the information is pretty much the same as I learned from Don Klein in 1966. So um, he was my he was my rabbi, I like to say. And uh, and I owe my career to him. Uh, oh, I'm curious. What, what what were some 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 of those important lessons that that uh, that Don taught you? Well, the biggest one, uh, and I take it with me to this day. And in fact, I see some people, and it just bothers the hell out of me. Uh, is you're not more important than the game. The game is what's important. And if you do your job well, you're like the referee. If you do it well, nobody's going to notice. And uh, and I take that with me to this day. I really do. I've never tried to put myself in front of the game. Um, you know, I just always have considered myself kind of the the chronicler, if you will, of the event. You know, I'm just kind of telling you what I'm looking at, you know. And, you know, the longer you do it, the more nuanced you get. And, you know, you learn how to prepare. I, I mean, I've always said that that going on the air and doing a game or the fight or whatever it happens to be or a show, if it's a studio show, is the easiest thing, easiest part of our business. The most difficult thing is being prepared to go in there and do it. Um, and, um, and so I, preparation is a big deal for me. And I think I can tell in almost in minutes watching somebody if they're prepared or not, you know, and, and nowadays it's such a dog eat dog business, which it wasn't when I got into it, uh, that you pretty much have to be pre uh, prepared. If you're, if you go into a game or a broadcast of any kind, half cocked, you're not going to last long. So that's that's changed a lot but those were all lessons i learned from don um you know he he always um he he, he taught me things like uh and, and these are just stupid little things that i carry with me to this day but i always hear people say today is the day that such and such and such and such and don always used to say today is the day is redundant <laughs> you, know, you don't have to say that you know, and he always used to say a college team is not a club, you know, and those are things that I've just carried with me. They're stupid little things, but I've always carried them with me, you know, and, um, you know, and I learned there was another guy that I learned a lot from, too, but later in later in my career. And that was Dick Shap. I don't know if you're familiar with Dick Shap. Dick Dick started the uh, sports reporter show on ESPN. He was the first guy to do that. He wrote all these as told to books. He was really an author, a writer more than anything else. Um, and he was really very well known, particularly for his books. More, he, It was like his first one was on Vince Lombardi, I think, you know, as told to. Uh, Vince Lombardi as told to Dick Schaap. And he did, I think he did Mickey Mantle. He did Willie Mays. He did, I mean, countless, you know, great athletes. And Dick had a really good reputation. He was one of the nicest people I ever worked with. And he told me, you know, you're just a part of the whole production, you know. So when you, you go to a, a game, or I'll, I'll use a game rather than a show of some sort, go in the truck, you know, introduce yourself to people in the truck, make sure you know that, that their names, not just the producer and director and switcher, but know the audio guy, know the replay guy, know the videotape people, know the, know the A1 and the A2, you know, know, know the people in the truck. And when the game is over, you go back into the truck and you thank everybody, you know, and if you're really feeling magnanimous, buy them a case of beer, you know, and leave it by the truck. Uh, and I, you know, those kinds of things I think have served me, really well through my through my whole career you know there's I, I i see too many egos in this business you know and it's the most volatile business that there is you know and at some point or other i promise you in your career at some point you're going to get fired everybody does you know it, and it's not a shame you know it's not like being a brain surgeon and getting fired <laughs> you know uh everybody does and so 
don't let your ego get away from you because it's when you get fired that you're going to really find out who your friends are. And, uh, you know, just those kinds of life lessons I learned from Don and from Dick and from other, a few other people too, along the way, I learned a lot about just the craft itself uh, from Dick Enberg, uh, who, you know, was when I kind of started, he was in the top of things, you know, and, uh, and we used to do, he did a lot of tennis and I did a lot of tennis. And uh, so we used to, I would see him at the French open. I would see him at Wimbledon and, and uh, sat with him for hours and hours and hours, just about the nuance of how you brought, how you do play by play, how every sport is different, you know? Um, so he was an influence on my career. I had a lot of them actually, you know, and, and that's the one piece of advice I would give maybe to you or any of your peers who are just now, turning over stones. <clears throat> and that is um, ask questions. You know, if you're working with somebody who's pretty well known, you know, say, hey, can I can I sit with you for just a couple minutes? I just want to pick your brain for a couple minutes. And I, I, I tell you, almost everybody will do that. Almost everybody. Yeah, that's that's certainly a great piece of advice. You know, you know, you know it's, it's always important to, to just ask questions. It's always important, important to just talk to people, you know? 100%. Because you never know, you know, you, the, the person that you're talking to today, it might be a production assistant, might be your boss down the road and in a position to hire you, you know, I mean, and, and you know what, just being nice to people goes a long way. It really does, because everybody in this industry is not like that. You know, and, and even more so now, I hate to say it, but it's a more ego driven business now. And you know, a lot of it has to do with social media, because it's all, hey, look at me, hey, look at me. You know, I mean, that's, you have to do that now. I'm not condemning it. I'm just saying it causes bigger egos. You know, if you've got, you know, a million followers, you know, and the guy you're applying for a job with next to you has 50,000, you're going to get the job. You know, so it, those kinds of things matter now. They didn't matter when I was, when I started, but, but now they do, you have to politic, you know, you have to do all that kind of stuff. And one other, one other piece of advice I will give you that, I give to any young person I'm talking to, you know, about, about this business. Uh, and that is, if anybody asks you if you've ever done this before, there's only one answer. Yes. Yes. You know, and then you just figure it out. And if you got the goods, you'll figure it out and you'll do fine. If you don't, you'll be back asking for work. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's funny because everyone here at Cronkite, you know, everyone I've talked to here is just, just like, just like say yes, say yes, no matter what. Absolutely. hundred percent, hundred percent. And it's, that's, I'm glad to hear them talking about that there. I was teaching a class uh, at Dominican university here, which is not far from where I live, Northern California, small school. Uh, and they were just starting to get a, a radio and television uh, course going. And I, I was, the, I, what I was teaching was storytelling for television. And, uh, and I, I, as I said, I give that advice to anybody who, asks me but uh i gave it to my class too and there were a lot of people who were like oh really you know just say you did it even if you didn't and you know i'd say yes i made a career out of that you know <laughs> i really did i you know i i started doing boxing i was working in at nbc uh, in new york and uh and they had the radio rights to the 1976 olympic games in montreal and so one day I overheard somebody, it wouldn't ask me, I overheard somebody say, uh, have you done boxing before? You know, and I was just standing there. I said, yeah, I have, you know, <laughs> and I, of course, you know, I'd gone to fight. My dad was a fight fan. So he would take me to fights here in San Francisco, but I'd never called a fight before. But my thinking was boxing. If you know your left hand from your right hand, you should be able to do boxing. Right. You know, <laughs> And, uh, and so that's how I started doing boxing. They gave me the boxing at the Olympics in 1976. And that happened to be the best American boxing team in history. So we got on the air a lot, you know, with Sugar Ray Leonard and, you know, all the, the, the Spinks brothers and all, uh, I think about eight of them wound up being world champions. So, yeah, that's, the, you know, it was just a question of kind of standing in a hallway someplace saying, oh, yeah, I can do that. You know, <laughs> that's how I started doing boxing. Wow, that's awesome! And of course, arguably, uh, boxing is is what you are most known for. So, so, so going off of that, um, how did uh, uh, 
Like, like, like how did you, how, how did that start, you know, calling boxing? How did your, how did that extensive experience, how did that lead to your role in Rocky four? <laughs> I'm not sure which led to which um, it, you know, it's funny. And you, you talk about, uh, and it's true. Now I'm probably more recognized as a boxing person and I am in the hall of fame now. So people think of me as a boxing guy, but at other times in my career, I, I've always liked, uh, let me say this. I've always liked doing different things. Uh, I, I'm sure I was probably ADD when I was a kid, but it wasn't, you know, diagnosed at that time. There was no such thing at that time, but I get stale if I do too much of one thing, you know, that's why I, I did baseball one year for the giants and they asked me to do 50 games. And I thought, well, I really don't want to do 50 of anything, but you know, it's my hometown team and it was major league baseball. And, you know, so I thought, okay, I'll do, I'll do the 50 games. And then next year they asked me to do a hundred. <laughs> and I said, no, you know, I, I, I was bored after 30, you know, <laughs> do, do, even do it. And that year the giants won 103 games. They were really good. You know? <laughs> and I was just bored to tears after yeah. about three games. So I've always liked the idea of doing several di different sports, you know, and, it, and I think honestly, uh, Sam, that's what, that's, that's what has allowed me to have as long a career as I've had, you know, because I think when I, when I was at ESPN, that was my use to ESPN was that I could do a lot of different things. Um, at HBO, when I was working at HBO, uh, boxing was the main thing, but they also did world championships in track and field and gymnastics and figure skating and swimming. And I did all of those, you know, and, um, and I, when I was younger, I, it got me because I've done like 10 Olympic games, you know, and, and there you're bouncing around from sport to sport. Um, so I've always enjoyed doing different things. So for a time, for a long time, I was a football and basketball guy because I did the Pac-10 and later the Pac-12. Um, and then um, then I became a tennis guy when I was at ESPN and at, at HBO. I did the Wimbledon tournament for for 15 years and. Uh, and then when I went to ESPN, I became their tennis guy as well as their boxing guy. Um, so for a long time, people thought of me as a tennis guy. You know, when the tennis channel started, I was the first person hired at the tennis channel, and uh, and now it's boxing. You know, so your career kind of goes like that: it was football and basketball, then it was tennis, then it was boxing. You know, uh, I did a lot of gymnastics for a long time. People thought of me as a gymnastics guy. You know, it, it's funny how that just happens when you do enough of something. People think of you, you get cubbyholed. That's a lot harder to do now than it was when I started, because now networks want to cubbyhole you. If you're a football guy, you're a football guy or maybe football and basketball. You know, if you're, um, you know, if you're a tennis guy, you're a tennis guy. If you're a boxing guy, you can move off a of, like uh, uh Test, Joe Tessitore does football and basketball and boxing. But they want to cubbyhole you much more now. You know, they want you to be an expert, you know, in uh, in whatever the sport is that you're doing. So I, I don't think my career would have gone the way it went if I were just kind of getting my chops now. Uh, the business has changed. You know, it's changed a lot. And a lot of it is better. And most of it is better, actually. Technologically, certainly it's better. Um, you know, and I, I can't say whether uh, it has a lot of good points now and it has a lot of bad points now. It, it, one of the things, when I started in the business, there was no teleprompters. There were no IFBs. Uh, so you better be able to ad lib, you know, because every night something would go wrong. When I was doing local news here, every night a film chain would break or something would break and you had to ad lib, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and now a lot of young people in this business are married to that prompter, you know, and they can't divorce themselves from it. And uh, yeah, and it's fine as long as nothing goes wrong. And technology is so good now that it seldom does. But when it does, they can't handle it, you know. So I think there's something about <laughs> starting back in the primitive days um, that that I think has in some way um, help my longevity. 
Yeah, yeah, you know, no, I think I think you made you made a great point. Uh, you know, you know, you, using the teleprompter. Uh, you know, I I I think so many people, you know, no, you know, they get they get used to that. You know, they're, they're just like, oh, you know, the words are right there. But then, you know, if you something know, happens, you know. Well, you know, here's another thing, and this is really esoteric crap, but uh, but I'll tell it to you anyway, and I believe it. Um, when you when you don't have a teleprompter there, you have to kind of come through the camera. When you have a teleprompter there, you're looking at the camera. So it, and television to me, uh, it's getting less so, but it's an intimate medium. You know, you're asking people to take you into their homes. You're asking people in some cases to take you into their bedroom, you know, into their most private places, you know. So you better be able to really relate to them rather than just stop at the screen like you're staring at a wall, you know. And sometimes you can even see people's eyes move following the teleprompter, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, I, that kind of stuff, I don't know. You know, again, I don't, a lot of my thoughts were born of how I started, when I started, and all that sort of thing. And the business has changed. You know, as I said, you know, uh, technology is so good, mistakes don't happen. I mean, once in a while, once in a blue moon, you know, uh, they happen. And when they do, you usually have a producer and you're saying, okay, do this, do that, do this, do that. You know, we didn't have any of that. You know, my only communication was through a stage manager. So it's changed in that regard, and it's better in a lot of aspects now. Uh, you know, certainly the graphics are like, oh, I, yeah. I, I hate to even tell you, when I first started local television, <laughs> we, we, we used to have like, it was an octagon, and it was shaped like, um, well, it was shaped in octagon shape, and it, you turned it, it, had eight sides. And, um, and, you know, in sometimes in hotels, they'll have the meetings for the day, you know, and they're set, their letters are actually placed into the uh, a black board and it's got little ledges in it and you put the letters in, you know, meeting, whatever the room is, 1030. That's how we did scores. We, we used to have a slave camera on this octagon. I would have to go into the studio a half hour before we went on the air and put Philadelphia three, you know, Oakland two, you know, <laughs> literally you actually put all the letters in. And then when you did the scores, they had a slave camera on it and the stage manager rotated the octagon. And that's how we did the scores on the air. <laughs> wow. Know? You know, uh, so, I mean, that's how far the business has come. Now the graphics are unbelievable. You know, I mean, they're, you know, you can make things spin and turn and pop and, you know, they're instant, you know, things are just right there, right now. And uh, I mean, that's the wonderful thing about what the business is now. And there's a lot of young people. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to come across like, uh, and I don't believe this, that boy, those were the good old days, you know, because I don't believe that. I think now is the good old days. But um, but um, I forgot where I was going with this. But, you know, a lot, there's a lot of really talented people out there now in every aspect of the business. You know, and that's the other thing that I think has changed a lot is when I started, like when I went to New York, I started at KPIX in San Francisco, started at KCBS radio, really. Then I went to KPIX in San Francisco or CBS station here and did local news for seven years. Uh, and I never had a producer. I didn't have a producer in, until I went to New York. You know, and when I went to New York, I had a choice because I was a writer. I had a choice. I could either be talent or I could be a producer. You know, and and at that time, it was a no brainer because you couldn't make any money as a producer. You could only make money as a talent. So I opted to be talent. If I had to do it over again now, I'd go be a producer in a heartbeat. You have much more control. You know, you, you make almost as much money with rare exceptions. Um, and your career is going to be a lot longer <laughs> more often than not. Mm. You know, I mean, I've lucked out. Believe me, being, you know, having done this for you know 50 years. And I've never been out of work, you know, I'm proud to say. Um, but that doesn't happen very much anymore. There are very few, you know, very few. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a, that is a very good point. Um, so, so, so let's, let's talk now. That, you know, we, we obviously have to talk about this. Uh, Rocky Four. So how, how did that come about? How did your role come about? What was filming like? And then what was it just like getting to work with, with Sylvester Stallone? What was he like on set? You know, all, th all those questions are interesting. I'll try to pick them off one at a time here. And if I miss any, jog me back here. 
um, I never really, really thought much about movies or, uh, you know, anything like that. I've never been enamored with Hollywood or uh, I'm not awed by being around famous people. Um, so I got the call. I got a call. I, I happened to have at that time. I was really busy. I was probably doing 75 or 80 shows a year. And uh, and I got I was home. I happened to be home for two weeks. And uh, I got a call from an agent who wasn't my agent. <laughs> it was a friend of mine's agent. Uh, and they had asked him to do it. and He couldn't do it. So she called me. He said, why don't you call Barry? So he she it was a woman. She called me and said, uh, how would you like to do to be the voice, the announcer in a Rocky movie? You know? and, I, and I thought, well, I've got two weeks time. It was going to take two weeks. Um, it might be interesting because I'm so used to live television, you know, and this is 100% different than that. And so anyway, so I agreed to do it. And it the I got paid. I'm not ashamed to tell you this. I got paid $2,500 for two weeks, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, do I want to do this, you know, <laughs> wait for two weeks and you know, knowing that I'm on the road all the rest of the year, you know. Anyway, uh, the bottom line is I went to, I went and did it. And it was shot, it was supposed to be winter in Moscow. And it was summer in Vancouver, British Columbia. <laughs> and uh, and so they, I get a script. And it's funny, just the other day, my wife and I were going through some memorabilia and I found the original <laughs> script. Um, I get a script and... Um, and it turns so it turns out that for the first week they're doing all the boxing scenes, and it's like a dance, you know. It, I mean, it literally is like you know in the old days you used to put footprints on a floor, and that's how you learn the steps. You follow the footprints, you know, and that's basically what it is. That's uh, neither, obviously neither Stallone or or uh, Dolph Lindgren was uh, a boxer, you know, and, and in fact Dolph Lindgren was about six five and Stallone's five ten. You know, so they had to account, always had to account for that height difference. Um, and it was brilliantly done. And Stallone directed that one. And he was brilliant. I mean, I really came away from that with a lot of respect for him. Because they had, they shot it almost like a live event, except obviously they did, they had 15 cameras and they did probably 100 takes, you know, of, of different they, they would take like a 30 second portion of it and do it. And that would take 15 takes and Stallone after every take, he would take a look at the rushes and, uh, and then he would say, okay, uh, camera 12, I want you to move back three feet, camera four. I want you to slide over. And then, you know, when the bell rings, I want you to push in, you know, he, he was amazing because he knew what, where every camera was and what every camera was doing. And he was the actor also, you know, I really was impressed with, with what he knew, but it's called choreography. And, um, and uh, so that went on to do that scene. It was, a, I want to say it was an 18 minute scene in the film. And uh, it took, I was there for 14 days. It took 12 days to do those things. Our part took one day. In fact, it took about one hour, you know, and, and again, I came away really impressed with Stallone because what he told me is, uh, do what you always do in boxing, but go about 25% over the top, you know, <laughs> which is exactly what I did. And I said, do you want me to follow the script? He said, no, just do it. Just call it like a call in a fight, but just go 25% over the script, you know, over the top, be a little more hysterical, you know, and, and that's exactly what I did. And we basically did it in, basically did it in one take, but he wanted a couple of different angles. So we took three takes uh, to do it. And, um, uh, you know, and and then I remember thinking to myself, so we wrapped, they wrapped after two weeks. I was truly impressed with with Stallone and a couple of the character actors I uh, I was very impressed with. The guy that played, if you're familiar with the film, the guy that played the part of the Russian manager. Yes. He was he he was a character actor that you've probably seen a million times and would never know his name. But he, there was one scene. <laughs> In it, and you might remember. So it was when Stallone uh, or Rocky started to 
make a comeback against uh, Drago. And uh, and between rounds, now the fight's going Rocky's way. So between rounds, the manager runs up on the ring apron and he has this diatribe. He's screaming at, at Drago in Russian. It's about 30 seconds, 35 seconds, something like that. He doesn't speak Russian, but he's a good enough actor that 35 seconds in Russian. They cut to Rocky's wife, who was at that time his girlfriend, Bridget Nielsen was her name. Dumb as a bag of rocks. <laughs> and uh, and so her, when when he would come up on the on the ring apron, do his diatribe in Russian, 35 seconds, she would stand up and her line was, Nyet, no, you know. First take, roll the cameras, guy runs up, 35 seconds in Russian, does it perfectly. She stands up, yet, Rocky's cut. <laughs> <laughs> give me uh, give me concern. You got to give me concern. Take two, roll the cameras. He comes up, 35 seconds, Russian, perfect. Doesn't speak Russian. She stands up, yet, <laughs> cut. Oh, to, make God. Story, to make a long story short, it took 35 takes for her to say, yet. He got his right every time, you know, wow. in Russian. <laughs> and finally, and the upshot of it all was, at the end of it all, Stallone finally just said, we'll loop it. You know, loop it means we'll do it in post-production, you know? So they didn't use any of the 35 takes. They had <laughs> some of their actors come in and loop it, and she just mouthed it, you know? And that that's what made me think, what the hell am I doing here? You know, I'm used yes. to, the red light goes on, you say hello, everybody, and the red light goes off, you say good night, you know? That's what that's what it is to me, you know. So this was two weeks sitting, and we had to be in every shot because we were ringside. So whenever there was a shot, a long shot of of the, the fight, um, we were in it. So you couldn't read a book, you couldn't couldn't do anything. You just had to sit there all day. And it was like twelve hours a day. You know? Oh man! So it was the most boring thing I'd ever done. And on top of all that, they paid me twenty five hundred dollars. I'm thinking, what the hell am I doing? The upshot of it all is. The way they edited the film, and I don't know anything about Hollywood unions or anything about that, but the way they edited the film, I was a principal in the film. So about, about two months after the film was released, I go to the mailbox and, I, and there's a thing from MGM and uh, I open it, it's a check for $40,000. You know, mm. and I and I didn't cash it because I thought there's got to be a mistake. I know it's a mistake. They're going to ask for the money back, you know. So I'm not going to cash it, you know. And I didn't. And about a month later, I go to the mailbox. There's another check for forty thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. And I called. I finally called, you know, and said, "I know this is a mistake. I just want to tell you." I said, "No, the way you, they cut the film, you became a principal, and ergo, you get residuals." So that was 34 years ago. I still get checks. Every time that movie airs, I get another check. Now, obviously, it's not $40,000. Mm. It's about, you know, $100 or $200. But 35 years later, 34 years later, I'm still getting checks from that movie that I bitched about for making $20,000. <laughs> that's my Rocky uh, story, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> uh, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. I, I'm, so, I'm so glad that you're that your great performance. For, truly, is it's you're still, still getting a... Still getting you still getting uh, um you know compensated for it. that's I awesome know, know. it's that's crazy awesome. It, it really is it's really um, yeah I think about it and because they have that Rocky Film Festival every Thanksgiving so I always know around Thanksgiving time you know maybe I could buy a couple of Christmas gifts for people you know because I'm getting a check yeah so. yeah like 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 what, what was it like what, what like the first time when you saw the movie you know, you know what was it like and then seeing yourself on no, like the yeah and obviously i didn't know what they were going to use you know like the guy that was sitting right next to me and during the filming he did as much as i did he was only on there for like 10 seconds so i'm sure he made no more than the 2500 that they gave him to begin with you know it just happened to be the way they cut it that my voice was i think it's 30 seconds if you're on on camera for 30 seconds or more, you become a principal, you know? So yeah, it was, uh, it was surreal. You know, it really was. And it was particularly surreal to watch the movie because I didn't know what they were going to use, you know? So yeah, I mean, it was one of those, one of those things, it, 
again, I, I mentioned to you right at the beginning, my whole career has been kind of serendipitous, you know, and that was a part of it. Yeah, yeah, de definitely. And, and you, you know, I just want to say that, that I always, always love your line in the movie when you're like, it's a gutter war, no holds yeah. barred in Moscow. I, I did that. That's stuck with me. Every <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it is amazing because, you know, obviously I'm not in your generation, obviously. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, I still do college basketball and, and uh, whenever that movie runs, it usually runs, as I said, right around Thanksgiving time. For the next two or three months, whenever I go to a game, I'll have some 18-year-old kid say, hey, man, I saw you in Rocky IV. You know? So that's been going on for 35 years. You know, it's, it, And to this day, it's, it's, it, it, it's the, uh, the gift that keeps on giving. You know? yep. Yeah, yeah, you got that right. So, so, so obviously that was a famous boxing match, but of course it's not real. It was, it was fictional. Right. Now let's let's talk about a real fight you were on the call <laughs> for a, a, a real awesome fight between Marvin Hagler and Thomas Hearns, uh, one of the one of the most memorable boxing matches ever. You were on the call for it. What was the experience like calling such an exciting and memorable fight? It was you know it was more the first round than the fight. The, the yeah. truth of the matter is the fight was after the first round the fight was over. You know for all intent, I think it lasted three, but but. Tommy Hearns had nothing left after the first round. Matter of fact, he didn't even have anything left at the end of the first round. Um, but that round was the greatest round I've ever seen. That round was better round than the Rocky rounds. <laughs> you, know? Um, uh, it, it, you know, it was one of those things. I, it's funny because people always remind me of things that I've said on the air in particular in, you know, any given event. And I don't remember any of them, you know, because you can't, you can't plan for those kinds of things. You know, you, you hope you say the right thing at the right time, you know, and, you know, hope that you can get it right more often than you don't. But that that's, I would say, if you get it, I, I've always thought if you get half of them, you're doing pretty good. You know, if you get it right, where you say exactly the thing you would have said, had you had time to rehearse it. Um, if you do that 50% of the time, you're doing pretty good. I always thought I'm right in that, right in that area. Uh, Al Michaels, who I think is the best I've ever heard at capturing a moment, you know, uh, and of course the, the miracle on ice call, you know, do you believe in miracles was one of the great calls of all time. And I've heard him do it on other things too. I would say he probably gets about 70%, but you can't get them all, you know? So you really don't know what you're going to say. And I remember, uh, with about 30 seconds or 35 seconds to go in that first round of that fight, I think I said something. That, uh, and this is only the first round, something like that. I don't remember exactly yeah. what the connotation was, but, uh, and people talk to me about that all the time, you know, and there were some others that I don't think were particularly, you know, brilliant by any stretch of the imagination that people ask me about, but I don't remember any of them. I do remember that round. And I always, to this day, I'll say that was the greatest round of boxing I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, 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 just you know, what are your thoughts on just on that whole era of boxing, and just, and just, you know, what are your thoughts on, on, you know, on like that area, and just, you know, how boxing has kind of evolved since then. Yeah, well, you know, I feel obviously blessed to have been calling fights in that area, and I'm still calling fights, but the sport has changed a lot. Um, it's not so much that the sport has changed. At that time, everybody fought everybody. Uh, when they were in their prime, you know, because there weren't that many people that were doing boxing. There weren't that many promoters who people who had their hands in it. Uh, you know, there was Don King and Bob Arum and on a big fight, they'd find a way to get along. So everybody fought everybody. You know, that's what made all those big fights. That's what made, uh, you know, Hagler Hearns. That's what made Leonard Hearns. That's what made Leonard Hagler. That's what made, uh, you know, Holmes and Cooney. That's what made, Tyson and, and uh, you know, anybody else, Buster Douglas, well, although that wasn't a big fight. But um, everybody fought everybody, and they did so in their prime. It's funny because just today I was reading a thing that somebody had written uh, about, they're talking now about Crawford and Spence fighting, two best welterweights out there. And they are, but they should have fought about three years ago. They're both kind of just starting on the other side of the mountain now. You know, whereas when when Leonard fought Hearns, they were both absolutely in their prime. 
you know, when, when Leonard fought Duran, they were both absolutely in their prime. And, uh, and that's the difference in boxing then and boxing now. And one of the reasons now is it's the television networks that own the fighters, you know, like the zone has its fighters and Bob Aram, who's in bed with ESPN, he has his fighters. I work for Showtime. We have our fighters. Uh, Fox has its fighters and it's never the twain. You know, an Aram fighter is never going to fight on Showtime. He won't have it because he's got to deal with ESPN and a Showtime fighter is not going to fight on ESPN. You know, so with rare exceptions, the best fights never happen or they happen too late. You know, that's kind of what happened with Canelo and Golovkin just recently. You know, uh, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago. And that Golovkin is on the other side of the mountain now. You know, he's not nearly what he was. And, he, and it was a lopsided fight. For that matter, Canelo is not what he was either. You know, so fights are happening way after the fact. You know, Pacquiao and Mayweather was a classic example of oh, yeah. a fight should have happened earlier and never did. And the fight was a dog. And everybody in, in my business knew it was going to be a dog, you know. Um, so that I think that's the biggest problem is is there's too many, too many hands in the pie right now, you know. And everybody's greedy. Everybody wants their, their take, you know. And uh, so it's very different, very different. Yeah, yeah, you got that right. It, it, it's it's a very different in, in the boxing landscape today. No question about it. It's it, the sport is the same, the fighters are the same, the people, the trainers, and people like that are the same. It's the money people who are not the same, and the networks for that matter. Yeah. Now, now let's go from boxing to uh, to to another big sport that you called. Uh, you've of course, you have had many great years of calling a Pac-10 football for uh, the Fox Sport for a Fox Sports. Many great years. Uh, how did you get into doing a college football for FSN? Uh, well, it, I put so many networks in the toilet, I can't even begin to tell you because um, Fox was yeah, Fox came later, but there was Prime Network. There was yeah. Uh, oh God, uh, Learfield Sports. There was uh, music, music TV. Um, there was I can't tell you how, Jefferson Pilot. They all had the Pac-10 or Pac-12 at one point or another, and um, yeah, it was just crazy, you know. Um, but um, I got into it actually when I was still doing local television here in San Francisco, and at that time they were doing we were doing replays. And, uh, and, you know, we do the game. Cal or Stanford was local. We do the game and, um, and, and then they play it back like that night or the next day or, you know, that kind of thing. And, and so I, uh, for a long time, I did Cal football replays. And then for another time, I did Stanford football replays. Uh, and that's how, I, that's how I started doing football play-by-play. -play. And, and it just kind of went from there, you know, I um, I started with Pac-10 uh, after that. I don't even remember what network. I think it was Prime Network then. Uh, and I did that. And, uh, and then when I went to ESPN, uh, they wouldn't let me work for another network. So, um, and I didn't do football for them. But they let me. So I did University of Washington radio for three years. I did Stanford radio for three years. And then uh, when I left ESPN, I went to Fox. Then I went back to doing network stuff. So that, that's how that's how football started. And basketball just kind of came along with it. You know, um, I think my first basketball was the there used to be a tournament here in the Bay Area called the Cable Car Classic. And I used to do that. And um you know, things just grow, you know, you, like I said, you stand up and you're in the right place at the right time. And uh, I, I worked for, I started doing basketball for a company called TVS and they were the first syndicators of college basketball. And at that time, syndication was a really big deal because there was no cable television. Uh, and so I started doing stuff for them way back, gosh, in, in uh, I think I started with them in about 1973, maybe somewhere in there. Um, so that was the forerunner of it. Uh and I've always done it. You know, I've, I've done basketball now every year for the last, gosh, I don't know, what, 50, 50 years. You know, so. 
Wow, that's awesome. Uh, now, 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 of course, you know, for as as we're talking, you know, about college football here, as an Arizona State uh, student and as an ASU fan, we have to talk about this one particular game that you were on the call for, arguably the biggest game in the history of of my school. Um, it's when we beat number one ranked Nebraska in 1996 at Sun Devil Stadium. Uh, what were your thoughts going into that game, and what was just going through your head as you saw just an incredible magical night unfold in Tempe. It was, you know, that's one of the more memorable college games I've ever done. Actually. Um, I didn't give them a chance. I, I mean, to be honest with you, I really didn't. Um, Nebraska at that time was omnipotent. You know, I mean, they were matter of fact, I remember doing a game in Lincoln one time and, uh, and on there, you know, like you walk into a restaurant and there's their schedule in the window, you know, and they would have their whatever it was, 11 game schedule. And at the end of it, it would say bowl game, you know, <laughs> like it was a given. They're going to a bowl game, you know. And at that time, there weren't that many bowl games. So, you know, it was like, uh, I, I remember that very game. I had to give a talk in Lincoln on a Tuesday. Now, the game was Saturday, but I had to go in Tuesday. And when I got off the plane, from the minute I got off the plane, people were saying, What about the game? How about the game? What do you think of the game? I'm thinking, I said, What game? You know, game's not till Saturday. You know, you're talking about this on Tuesday, you know, and uh, that, it's life or death there, you know, in in uh, in Nebraska, not only in Nebraska, but at that time they were, you know, they were an elite team. And uh, so I didn't give them a prayer, give Arizona State a prayer in that game, uh, even though they had Jake Plummer, who was pretty good quarterback, you know, Um. But, you, you know, you could kind of see it coming as that game started. You know, it was like, you know, Nebraska was just, they were bigger, they were faster, all that kind of stuff. As a matter of fact, I'll give you another aside. Mike Price, who coached at Washington State during that time, I was doing a game up there and, and Mike said to us, um, he said, you know, we got to get some of those Nebraska pants. You know, they got those big butts in them and those big thighs. <laughs> we got to get some of those pants, you know. And that's what Nebraska was. They were just giants and faster than you and bigger than you and deeper than you. And um, and so that's what made that game that much more uh, enticing. But you could kind of see it coming early in the game. Uh, and and this, this happens, you know, a lot of times where you see a team hanging around and hanging around and hanging around. And after a while, you start to think, you know what? They're hanging around. This could happen, you know, and and that's what happened in that game. And uh, my fondest memory of that game, quite honestly, is before we left, before we got off the air, actually, I remember looking out the stadium over the lip of the stadium and I could see the goalposts going down Mill Avenue. You know, well. it was it was uh, yeah, it was people still talk about that game. You know, I, I get asked about that game every now and then, especially by people at Arizona State, you know, or in, in that area, Tempe, Phoenix. Scottsdale area. Um, yeah, that was a really special game, you know, and one of those great, great wins that you don't see very much and you're going to see less and less because now, of course, it's the rich getting richer. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's, uh, you know, it's crazy how, how the college football landscape, you know, we were talking about, we were just talking about boxing, how that's changed. College football has changed, you know, a heck of a lot and really in just, and honestly, in, in just, you know, very you know short span of just these last couple of years you know with all the nil stuff and yep. it, it, you know it, it's crazy it, it is so i'm curious though if i could ask you a question what do your peers think of that i mean do they think this is great or do they think it's the rich getting richer yeah it, it, it's i would say it's pretty mixed it, it's pretty mixed you know you know from from like a lot, a lot of my friends you know it's like a lot of people are like are like are like okay with it so people are fine with it but some Others are just, just, they hate it. They hate where college football is going, you know? And, and, and I think, you know, you know, now that we're, I think a lot of people here don't like it because, you know, we go to Arizona state and we're not a powerhouse school, you know, we're not, we don't have, we're not like, like a rich school really, you know? And, and I mean, I do think ASU has a lot, brings in a lot of money, but at least in terms of the football program, you know, don't have, you know, don't have all that money and uh, don't necessarily have the tradition that, you know, a lot of other big schools do. So. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm all for the NIL. I mean, I think, you know, schools have made money off marquee athletes for years. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm in favor of the NIL. 
but I think it has, it's got to have its limitations, you know, because yeah. there again, the rich are getting richer, you know, there's, a, you know, it's going to be hard to recruit the local athletes. And ASU has always done really well with that, you know, of, of keeping the local kids home. But if you get a five-star recruit, you know, there's a pretty good chance he's going to Alabama or Clemson or, you know, I did the, I used to do the uh, California state high school championship game every year. And the last one I did was modern day in St. John Bosco and the two quarterbacks in that game, one of them is the quarterback at Alabama and the other was the quarterback at Clemson, you know, and that never used to happen. If you were an in-state five-star recruit, you're going to SC or UCLA or maybe even one of the Arizona schools because they ASU used to recruit really heavily in the LA area, you know, uh, and that those days are gone, you know, maybe SC because they can compete at the, with, with the NIL, but a state school, I can't see it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, we're d d definitely in, in a different world of college football now, but uh, you know, it's, it is kind of exciting. I mean, I mean, you got USC and UCLA going to the big 10. So it's, you know, you got, Texas, so you go into the SEC. It's just, it's, it's kind of pandemonium, but it, it, it's, it's honestly kind of exciting. Oh, it is. It's and all the cards haven't been played yet. It's going to be interesting to see where it all falls, and and how it's going to shake out. I mean, I have to think there'll be a super league, you know, and then mm -hmm. there's going to be everybody else, you know, yep. the twenty teams, you know, um, and that and the transfer rule also really bothers me, to be honest. Not quite as much in football as it does in basketball, you know, but you get a team. ASU is not a good example because they generally speaking their top half, but a team like Cal, you know, where the program is really down, there's not a lot of alumni support. Um, they're not really endowed very well. They get a kid like the Bradley kid that they had a couple of years ago and he leads the league in scoring. And now that's a kid you can build on. And so you get a kid like him and now you could recruit around him and you get one more, one more kid who could play. And now at least you're in the top half, but with the transfer rule now, and this is what happened with him, he's gone and now you got nothing. You don't even have him, you know? And I think that's where it's really going to rear its ugly head is in basketball. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am in total agreement with you there. It's uh, yeah. Just, just call it sports in general, just a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of moving pieces and just, you yeah. know, yeah. So it's, it's definitely crazy. Um, you, you know, no, I'm curious, curious, Barry, you know, you know um, I mean, kind of, kind of, kind of, just looking back at just all the stuff you've accomplished uh, uh, in 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 your career, you know, just 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 how, how do you feel today? You know, just looking back at just all this incredible stuff that you've done uh, in your life. I feel like I've been dipped in shit. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, it, like I told you, I, I and I'm really not exaggerating. I've just been so lucky you know, in my career. And, and no matter what, you're going to need some of that. You know, you can be the greatest. I know a lot of people who are supremely talented who can't get a gig, you know. And when I started, I can tell you for a fact, I was not supremely talented, you know. Uh, you know, I, you learn. I learned on the job, you know. Unfortunately, I worked for people who were willing to stand by me and, you know, wait till I got better at it, you know. But, um, yeah, I do. I feel... I feel so lucky in my career. Um, you know, I feel I, I, I've had a chance to do so many events that when I was a kid, I could only read about, you know, I mean, I did Wimbledon for 15 years. I did the French Open. I did the Tour de France. I did world championships and in, in all the sports. I told you gymnastics, figure skating, track and field, swimming, diving. Uh, you know, I did triple crown of horse racing. I, I, and I, that's just to be in 10 Olympic games, you know, um, I've really been lucky, man, you know, just, and I've, I've had a lot of people help me, you know, a lot of people, you know, I got really lucky going to HBO when it, I, when I got hired at HBO, I didn't even know what HBO was, you know, I, I was doing a show in Russia actually. And, uh, and there was a guy, Marty Glickman, I don't know if you know that name or not, but, Marty's been a mentor to a lot of young people and Marv Albert, he, he was a mentor to Marv Albert and kind of to me too. Um, and Marty said, you know, I'm doing some stuff for this little cable network and uh, we're looking for somebody to do some things out on the West coast. Are, are you interested? And I was freelancing, you know, and I thought, sure. I didn't know what cable television was. I really didn't. There wasn't cable television where I was. And, uh, 
And they called me a couple of weeks later and asked me to do it. Actually, it was a gymnastics event. And I did it. And then they called back two weeks later and said, would you like to do boxing? And that's how I wound up doing boxing at HBO. And then they just happened to get all the great fights all through the 80s and 90s. You know? And still, you know, now I'm at Showtime, we still have great fights. You know? so And even at Fox, we had a few decent fights. So, yeah, I've just, it's been so, I, I use the word often, but serendipitous, you know, I've just happened to be in the right place, you know, um, really lucky, really lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, well Hey, you know, nowhere you, 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 obviously you might be lucky, but, 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 but honestly, you know, I don't think you could have gotten to where you are today without just being an enormously talented broadcaster because, because <laughs> you certainly are. You know, it's such a subjective business. It's in the eye of the beholder. It really is. And and that's one of the things you as an aspiring broadcaster, at some point you have to get used to. And that is that some people are going to love you. Some people are going to hate you. You know, yep, you got that's that right. The way it is. You throw it out there and you got to be able to walk out of that game or event or studio, or whatever it happens to be. And you got to know, was that a good show or a bad show? You know, and you, you don't need Joe Sixpack to tell you you were great or you sucked, you know. It's it's hard. You get you have to develop kind of that thick skin, you know. And everybody gets ripped at one point or another. I mean, it happens, you know, because it's a subjective business. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is, um, you know. But and, and you know that's something that that's talked about, you know, here a lot is that they know you get, you have to have thick skin in in the, in the business. You, know, you, you do know, because you know. It, generally speaking, it has nothing to do with how good you are. You know, it really doesn't. As I told you, there's a lot of really talented people that I know that are on the bricks. And there's a lot of not very talented people that I know that are working in network jobs. You know, as a matter of fact, I, I was just say it's easier at the network than it was doing local, you know, because local, you don't have a lot of support. You don't have a lot of backup at the network. Somebody's going to catch you. If you start to fall, somebody's going to catch you. You know, it might be the producer, it might be the director, it might be the stage manager, it might be your color analyst. Somebody's going to save you. But that's not true when you're just out there doing it by yourself. You know, um, so uh, truthfully, I, I thought the hardest part of my career was basically learning how to do it in the first place. And that was when I was doing local television at KPIX. Wow. And, 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 and I mean, just it's crazy looking back at that and then looking, you know, to just everything you've done since, you know. Yeah, like I said, it, <laughs> you know, it just, I mean, I had, I, I started in radio and, uh, and I had the general manager, the change general managers at the station and the new general manager came in and he said, uh, you're, you might want to look for something else because you're never going to make it in sports broadcasting because you don't have the voice for it. That was the guy I was signing my checks, telling me I should find another job. You know, and and I did. You know, and it was doing television. You know, um, but even that was a fluke. I mean, it, you know, it was all just here I am again, serendipitous. You know, well, well, well I am certainly glad glad that that they they kept on. You know, with sports <laughs> broadcasting, I, I'm glad because because we have because uh, the world is as as uh, you've given the world just so many great calls and great memories, whether it be in movies or you're just be, you know, in a, you know, in boxing or football um, arena football, which, you know, we just, I'll just quickly mention, I love, I love your calls of arena football back in the day. Thanks. I appreciate um, that a lot. It's yeah. I mean, like I said, it's been, it's been long and fruitful and I couldn't have asked for more. It's nothing I ever would have or could have expected when I was, even your, when I was your age, I didn't, I didn't know when I was your age, I didn't know what I was going to do. I honestly didn't, you know, and I was completely immature. You know, I don't know how old you are, but I was, I was 22 or 23 and going on 14, you know, <laughs> totally irresponsible, you know, crazy, you know? So it just, well, you know, it just somehow wound up on my feet, you know, but you know, you can do it. I promise you. And you know, you're in the right place. I will tell you that too. The Cronkite school is one of the great schools. I know people there who, I don't know if they still, Mark Rita, I don't know if he still teaches there. He was one of my original producers at Fox through football. Um, and um, uh, there have been a couple of other people too. One of them I know is not there anymore, but it's a great place to be. And it has a great reputation. And when you walk in the door of a prospective employer, 
and say you went to Cronkite School, more doors will open for you. Yeah, well, 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 honestly, uh, th- thank you for saying that. Thank you. And obviously, you know, the Cronkite School, it's awesome. And I'm, 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 happy, I'm happy to be at it. It's, uh, you know, great, it's a great faculty. Place to be. And great... It's not, an easy, not the easiest place in the world to be at these days. You yeah. know, I mean, you got to have something going to get in there. You know, and uh, yeah, it's a great place. It's, it's, I'm not sure, but that it hasn't usurped Syracuse, to be honest with you. Syracuse serves ESPN. You're probably not going to get a job at ESPN if you, unless you went to Syracuse. (laughs) Maybe Ithaca, but, but there is a real East Coast bias at at ESPN. But there's plenty of other places now. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I mean, you know, there's, I mean, you, you obviously you have, you have ASU, but, you know, Northwestern has a very good one. They do. Uh, they you do. know, USC and Annenberg, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of great journalism school just, just, just everywhere. Um, yeah, but, yeah. My daughter and, went, to, went to film school at USC. Really? That's awesome. Yeah. 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 But, but yeah, there are so many great, great, uh, great places. And, and obviously, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's important that, that that the broadcast, the aspiring broadcasters of you know of today, you know uh, that that they uh, that they you know go back and then they watch you know the broadcasters you know like 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 previously whether whether it be you Al Michaels um you know we even uh you know guys like Marv Albert Bob Costas just all all the greats yeah no I did that you know with the people that came before me and um, I'm flattered that that you guys do do that and not it has nothing to do with ego but you know, if, even if you, it's good to know, even if you don't want to be me, don't then watch me and don't do what I do. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, look at everything. Look at what you like. Look at what you don't like. Look at people you, you know, you admire and you think do a good job and look at people who you don't think do a good job. You know, um, I'm glad to hear that because, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons I stopped teaching, to be honest with you, is that I found that, um, and it may just be, you know, I grew up obviously in a very different time and, you know, where radio was still big and, you know, you, you could only read about sports, you know, there wasn't that much of it on television, you know. Um, and so I, you know, I, I knew the history of sports, you know, I wanted to know the history of sports. And I think a lot of people your age now, um, history is like six months ago. You know, and it's just the nature of the beast. It's, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying it's a different world now. And, you know, this is your world now. You know, everything you need is right here. Uh, whereas, you know, it wasn't so when I was when I was growing up. You know, I mentioned uh, I mentioned that uh, that one of my students one time asked me uh, about people that I'd worked with. And I've been really lucky over the course of my career to work with really good and accomplished color analysts. But when anybody ever asked me that, I always say uh, the two names I always mention are Arthur Ashe and Billie Jean King, who I did Wimbledon with for 15 years. Um, And Billy and I have been friends for 50 years. and so I met that somebody asked me that, and I mentioned Arthur Ashe and Billie Jean King. And I looked out at my class, and it was a sea of empty faces. Not one of them, not one person in my class knew who either one of them was. You know, and and the reason I mentioned them is because they're far more than sports. They go way beyond sports, you know. And I had some athletes in my class, women athletes, you know, and and I would I would say to them, you know, you're here on a ride. Partially because of this person, you know, and you don't know who she is. If she, if you ever see her, you ought to go over and shake her hand, you know. Mm. And Arthur went way beyond just being a tennis player. You know, I mean, he was apartheid, came apart in large part because of Arthur Ashe. You know, he was very political, you know. He broke all kinds of ground, racial ground in tennis, you know, and in other sports too, for that matter. You know, so I thought they should at least know those two beyond the world of sports. And it, and it, quite frankly, it, 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 didn't give me a very good feeling that nobody knew who either one of them was. Yeah. Like, like that, that's, that, that's surprising. When you told me that I was like, in my head, I was like, Whoa, really? Wow, yeah. That's- yeah. It's true. Sorry for the shadow here. The sun's starting to drop. <laughs> Maybe I should get in the sun. You can see me. Actually. <laughs> but, but yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point point that you make that, that, that I think that's a great thing about sports is that, 
many times, you know, the people within sports, you know, sometimes it, it goes beyond, ju- ju- you know, just what's on, what's on a field or a court or whatnot, you know, it, it really goes Absolutely. down. Just the whole it world. does, but, you know, again, that's kind of the nature of the beast, you know, that we're in a different world, you know, and history is yesterday, you know, mm-hmm. um, and that, that that's not that's not your problem. That's my problem. You know, I need to understand that. You know, although I will tell you that now, even though I've been doing this for all these years, I will never mention anything that happened in sports more than ten years ago on a broadcast. I'll never go back and talk about the seventies or the eighties or the nineties or the two thousands, for that matter. You know, because. People don't care. Young people don't care. You know, and, and again, I'm not saying I'm not wagging my finger at, at young people in, in general or at you in particular. It's just a different world, you know. So we live in that different world. Yeah, it, it cer- certainly is. But, 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 you know, there's one thing I can say I could say about about the world we're living in is that I'm glad we're living in a world where, where we got to hear your great of broadcasting. <laughs> well, I really well, I'll, I'll say that. Thank you. C- certainly very um once again just thank you so much for joining me today i'm truly an honor to talk to you i'm just one of one of the absolute greats in our business in my opinion and you know you've just you've given the world just so uh, so many great memories so it's truly well truly i really honor. appreciate it and uh who knows maybe hoop season i might get down that way so actually i have a fight down there on the 29th of this month Oh, really awesome yeah. what what is it it's you probably know this guy see here's here's a little quiz for you jake paul yeah, oh my gosh yep jake paul yep <laughs> yeah so it's his fight it's at the gila river casino oh that's awesome what wow, wow so you're gonna are you are you gonna be on the call for that yeah i'm doing well i'm actually doing the international broadcast of that yeah oh sweet awesome yeah, yeah. So. Uh, it's so cool that, that that you'll that you'll be down here. That's so cool. Well, uh, yeah. Let me know if you, if you know if you want to go. I don't know what tickets are like, but I might be able to score you some if you or one of your friends want to come. So, hey, 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 hey I, I, that would be that would be that would be pretty awesome. I, I definitely wouldn't mind seeing that. Jot, jot me a note about it, and uh, I'll ask when I, I won't know until I get there. But uh, usually we have control of tickets, but this is Jake Paul's production, so I don't know. But I'll see what I can do. It'll be crazy. I've done a few of his fights. I can tell you, it's crazy. It's nuts. Yeah, it'll, it'll definitely be exciting. But but but, but, but thank you, Barry. That, that's actually sure. that's super kind. I appreciate that. Sure, sure. Cool. But, all but, right, but, Sam. Yeah, all right, Barry. Uh, just once again, thank you so much, truly. No, no problem at all. Thanks. So yep. hope we talk again. Yes, for sure. You take care, Barry. All right, Sam. Thanks. Thanks.